My name is Jennifer Giggy, and I am the Packaging Department Scientist at Nelson Labs in the Salt Lake City location. Nelson Labs opened a new transportation and distribution test lab in 2018 uh, as part of a packaging expansion project. Today, I would like to go over what distribution testing is, why it's important, and what capabilities Nelson Labs currently has for this test method in our new distribution lab. Have you ever wondered what happens between the time you press the confirm order button on your computer and a package arrives on your doorstep? Well, probably not. But there's actually a lot that goes into getting a package from point A to point B. And a lot can happen to a package during that time. Shipping and distribution testing simulates some of the known hazards or things that can happen during the shipping process. So we can feel confident that packages are strong enough to make it from point A to point B in one piece. Let's look at this video that I found on YouTube. It shows an Amazon warehouse on Cyber Monday. I want you to watch for some types of hazards and potential causes of damage during the shipping process. So Cyber Monday is a very busy day, obviously. Um, they have a lot of things going on every day, but you can see lots of boxes moving through packages, uh, moving packages through the line. We've got lots of conveyor belts, boxes coming down lines this way, that way. Uh, Amazon's got robots with these shelving units that move boxes around the warehouse. And they also move individual packages. Here we have more conveyor belts, the, the yellow things pushing things from one belt onto another belt. Here's a nice chute system with a nice slide and they come down. Here's a truck getting ready for going out to send all these boxes to your, your address. And there's more boxes coming down more conveyor belts. And look at all those trucks that are going to be leaving the distribution hub. So I hope that's a, a good look inside what a distribution center looks like. So as the boxes are moved through the warehouse, I see three main hazards. The first one is drop. Uh, the boxes are traveling at high speeds on those conveyor belts and they're going around corners and crossing from one line to another. So at any point, these boxes could fall off a conveyor, conveyor belt or, you know, maybe on one of those stack units as it was coming around a corner. Um, as the boxes are bumping up against one another, you have side impacts. Boxes will also jam against the railings on those belts and you can get impact forces when the boxes are redirected from one line to another. Uh, if those boxes jam up on the line, you can also get some compression, particularly on the sides. Also, there are some points in the process where a conveyor line stops and boxes bottleneck in a collection area. After leaving the warehouse, the boxes are transported long distances by large trucks. These trucks are not climate controlled, unless maybe they're transporting food. Uh, so there's temperature extremes from day to night and winter to summer, Arizona to the Colorado Rockies. Think of how warm it is in July. Now imagine how warm your car is, which has been sitting in the July sun. And in winter, your parked car gets below freezing. These packages inside these non-climate controlled truck trailers, they're experiencing these same extremes. Next, uh, there's vibration. Obviously, these semi-trucks are not like riding in a Cadillac. Well, the driver has some nice suspension in the cab, but the boxes are definitely riding in economy back there in the trailer. Finally, there's compression. If you own the trucking company, would you send the truck full or partially full? Uh, we saw in the video that those boxes were stacked floor to ceiling in the truck, uh, and 
they are very good at, say, Tetris and getting the boxes packed in there as tightly as they can. So think of it as if each box was worth a dollar, would you want to send 100 boxes or 50? Obviously, you'd want to send more boxes because that would be cheaper. So they fill these trucks up to capacity. Uh, have you ever helped someone load a moving van? And very near the end, when the box or the truck is mostly full, they bring out a box full of books. Uh, well, there's nowhere else to put it but on top of other stuff, even though it's very heavy. So similarly, the truck is loaded from front to rear, and you can't guarantee that the lightest boxes are always on the top. So if you're a box on the top, then you know maybe it's not too bad, but the boxes on the bottom are potentially seeing a lot of compressive load. Um, now, the boxes will usually go to another type of distribution center, where they're again moved around and then placed into smaller delivery trucks. Delivery trucks have shelves on the sides that can be loaded strategically so the driver can access the boxes for delivery at each stop. Um, this helps with the compression, but it brings out a couple of new hazards. So we still have vibration, but this vibration is different. City streets are not as smooth as highways, and the boxes are not packed as tightly, so they're free to bounce and move around a lot more. Uh, we call this loose load vibration. As the delivery driver progresses through his route, uh, the truck becomes emptier and there's even more room for the boxes to move. Uh, the picture on the left shows the truck as it arrived on our dock. The picture on the right is the truck as it left our dock. Well, the first thing I notice is that we receive a lot of boxes. Uh, the next thing uh, I see is that when the truck is full, there are boxes on edges or corners. Um, maybe they moved or toppled over when the truck rounded a corner. Uh, these create an impact hazard. Also, there are boxes that are too large for the shelves, so they overhang over the edge. Uh, these edges are raised to keep the boxes from sliding off when the truck comes around a corner. And, and now we have a concentrated impact situation as the boxes bounce on this thin metal support, which they were not necessarily designed to do. So uh, at any point in the process, the box can be dropped, squished, shaken, frozen, or cooked. Uh, the question is, can it make it safely to its final destination unharmed? Well, some people ask us if it's acceptable to just ship it and see what happens. For example, they want to ship something to a sister facility or maybe a friend across the country. Uh, then have the person return it back to them, and now it's gone through two shipping cycles, right? Uh, would it be sufficient to examine the box upon its arrival to its original destination, document any damage or other observations, and write it up as a shipping validation? Does that work? Well, not really, and here's why. When you ship something, you never know what kind of hazards or stresses it will see. Maybe the box gets lucky and has a great trip. Maybe the weather is perfect and there's minimal handling along the way. Or just maybe it turns out to be one of those trips where everything goes wrong. Let's say, for example, you went on a trip. You made all your airline connections and your luggage didn't get lost. Does that mean air travel is always good? What if the opposite is true and uh, you were delayed? <laughs> you missed your connecting flight and spent a sleepless night in the airport, only to arrive at your final destination and find your luggage was lost somewhere. Well, would that mean that air travel was really bad? So the take home message here is that we need something uniform and consistent that we can use to challenge shipping containers so they all see the same uniform conditions. That way we can make informed evaluations on their performance. I like to do 3D printing. Here are two 3D pens that I bought. The one on the left is a paperboard box, and paperboard is kind of like poster board or heavy cardstock. The one on the right is a corrugated box with a paperboard sleeve cover. Corrugates, you know, that normal brown cardboard box that we're all used to seeing. Uh, both of these boxes were shipped to me in a plastic mailer bag over the box you're seeing in this picture. Uh, the paperboard box is 
crushed and it's a little misshapen. Well, the corrugate box looks pretty good. So which one do you think would fail a shipping test? And why? Actually, this is a trick question. There are no set criteria for passing or failing. Each company has to determine their own criteria and rationalize why they chose that criteria. So while the paperboard box looks really bad, uh, this damage, it may just be cosmetic. In fact, both 3D pens are intact and they both function as expected. So depending on the acceptance criteria that you choose, both of these may actually pass. Shipping and distribution testing is applicable to many industries. Um, medical devices and pharmaceutical products need to be ship tested, but so do food and other commer commerce. Uh, there's a single set of test standards for all industries. These are ASTM and ISTA. ASTM is the American Standard Test Methods, and ISTA is the International Safe Transit Association. So each standard has a number of choices or options. Um, think of the test standard as maybe a cookie recipe book. All cookies have the same basic ingredients like flour and eggs and sugar, but if you change the amount of the basic ingredients or add a few different ones, then you get a very different cookie. If you take a poll of cookie lovers, most will prefer chocolate chip cookies. Likewise, both of these standards have a favorite recipe. Uh, this would be DC 13 for AS ASTM and 3A for ISTA. These are the most commonly used test sequences as they're designed for single parcel delivery under 150 pounds, which is the category that most commerce falls into. So, We've used the term hazards. Uh, shipping hazard is some kind of stress, like drop, impact, or vibration. Uh, we, we're gonna liken these to the basic ingredients for cookies, you know, the flour, the eggs, and the sugar. Um, we're gonna go over the basic components of the chocolate chip cookie recipe for distribution testing. And I, I know some people really like snickerdoodles or macaroons, which use some of the same hazards but they also use other hazards, which you know, we may or may not have included in our test lab because they're not as common. So let's go over the common hazards. We already discussed temperature swings or extremes that packages can see during transit. The test standards have environmental test cycles, which are designed to mimic these conditions. And we use special incubating chambers to get to those conditions. Uh, these are the three most common environmental conditioning cycles, extreme cold, tropical, and desert. Extreme cold is very cold. Uh, minus 30 C converts to minus 22 Fahrenheit. Um, that's a pretty harsh winter. Uh, tropical is hot and humid. Uh, 40 C it converts to about 104 Fahrenheit. And when you add in that 90% relative humidity, whew, that's very wet. Desert is hotter at 60, uh, that's about 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and very dry. So think of traveling through Siberia in the winter, then through the rainforest, and finally back through the Mojave Desert. <laughs> that's a fun trip, right? Well, very often, the sponsor will have us run all three in sequence and the test boxes, and usually the boxes will spend maybe one to three days at each condition. So they get to take that trip a lot. Here's our environmental chambers. These chambers are different from typical incubators because they're equipped with both heating and cooling capabilities and they're humidity controlled. So a typical incubator is designed to operate in a very narrow temperature and humidity range. Environmental chambers, operate over the entire temperature and humidity spectrum. Uh, they also have controllers that are like little computers that can be programmed to run cycles so they can switch between different temperature extremes. So the idea here is that you put the samples into the chamber, you press the start button, and the product goes from super cold to hot and humid and even hotter and dry, and then you pull it out. Uh, the larger chamber, will hold one to two pallets, and the smaller one will hold about a half a pallet. 
Drop testing simulates all the dropping that can occur when boxes are moved around. Uh, here's some pictures of our drop tester. It has a platen that can travel up and down to different heights. This platen will swing back, causing the box to drop, kind of like the dunk booth at the carnival. You know, you throw the ball, and if you hit the target, then the poor guy sitting on the bench <laughs> falls into, into the water below. So these boxes, we drop them from faces, edges, and corners, because, you know, you never know how they're going to land in real life. Uh, the picture on the left shows a face drop, and the picture on the right is a corner drop. Uh, most of these test cycles will start with a series of drops, and then they'll finish with a repeat of those same series of drops. Yeah, here's a quick video of our drop tester in action. Boom. So the platen swings back, package falls to the ground. Um, compression testing is the next one we'll talk about. It's designed to simulate the load that boxes may see when traveling in a truck. Uh, here's the compression tester. The plates are two and a half by two and a half feet, and they're going to move up and down. The box is placed between the plates, and the plates come together until the set compressive load is reached. Uh, the compressive load value is determined mathematically using an equation. It's based on box dimensions and sometimes box weight, depends on the, the particular recipe that you're following. Uh, typical compression values are anywhere between 100 pounds and like 3,000 pounds. Uh, we usually are going to only test the box in its normal orientation, which is how the box is designed to hold the most weight. Uh, I didn't add a video of this test because this platen moves at a rate of a half an inch per minute, and it's kind of like watching paint dry. So the next one we'll talk about is loose load vibration. This is our mechanical shaker. Uh, it's a rotary shaker that moves in a continuous one inch circle. Uh, the hazard is designed to simulate driving in that smaller delivery truck. We normally run this vibration on three faces because you can't always guarantee that the boxes will travel in the normal shipping orientation. Uh, you saw a lot in the pictures of boxes that were not face up, maybe they were turned on their side or something so that they could squeeze more boxes into a tight space. So let's look at our shaker in action. There we go. So you see it just moves around in a one inch continual path and the box just kind of bounces up and down. Um, next, we have random vibration. That's designed to simulate the vibration that occurs in those long haul or semi trucks that we see on the freeway. So vibration profiles were developed using a little motion sensing device called an accelerometer. Um, they took these accelerometers and they put them into lots of trucks and drove them all across the country and they measured the actual vibration that's occurring on the road. Then all that data was compiled to develop these vibration profiles. There's three standard profiles for truck. There's a high intensity profile, a medium intensity profile, and the low intensity profile. There's also some air profiles and rail profiles to mimic, to mimic uh, travel by train and airplane. Uh, an ASTM DC 13 cycle, remember that's our chocolate chip cookie, would include all three intensity truck profiles and an air profile, and we would normally run those on three different faces. So our vibration table is five feet by five feet. Uh, it has little threaded inserts uh, in a grid pattern across it. We, we use those inserts to attach supports so we can keep samples from vibrating off the table or falling over when we run the test. Uh, the supports can not restrict the movement up and down of the samples, so it's just designed to keep them from sliding off. Uh, this is a wrapped pallet in this picture. Palette testing it follows a different cookie recipe, and most of those special cookie ingredients for palette testing are not currently in our test lab. Um, here's uh, another set of boxes. You can see here that if we vibrated these boxes in this orientation, that obviously they're going to fall over. So these supports become very helpful. Let's watch the video and see what this motion looks like. Um, this is a truck profile. 
obviously if we ran the air profile or the train profile, uh, the movement would be a little bit different. Okay, next hazard would be altitude. Altitude testing is designed to mimic changes in pressure that occur when boxes are transported over high mountain passes or in unpressurized aircraft. Uh, the samples are placed into a large vacuum chamber and a vacuum is drawn. The vacuum level directly correlates to an altitude change. So this test is optional if you have porous packaging because those packages naturally equilibrate as the air can move across the packaging barrier. But altitude testing is required for non-porous packaging. So for an example, let's think of a potato chip bag. Have you ever gotten one that was really super puffy? Well, it was probably packaged at a lower elevation and then taken to a higher elevation for distribution. The greater the increase in altitude, the more the expansion will occur. So let's imagine what happens if that potato chip bag continues to expand and expand and expand. It's going to pop and we're going to have potato chips all over the truck. Uh, that's really messy for potato chips. But imagine if that package contained a medical device. <laughs> now, if the packaging bursts in transport, then the package is no longer sterile and it's not fit for use. Our last hazard that we'll talk about today is concentrated impact. Concentrated impact is designed to mimic impacts from the sorting rods that redirect items on conveyor belts or maybe boxes overhanging the shelves in delivery trucks. Um, we take an impact or a missile in the picture here. Uh, it's about four inches long, a little over an inch in diameter. Uh, the dimensions and weight are actually specified in the test standard. Uh, we drop this impactor through a guide tube from a set distance onto the test space. Uh, if the impactor goes through the box, like the picture in the slide, then that's a failure. Uh, and if it doesn't, then it passes. So let's see this test in action. All right, that box passes. So if your box is double walled, corrugate, or if it exceeds a certain burst strength, then your box is considered to be strong, so you don't actually have to do uh, impact testing. But if your box is weaker, then that is a required test. So that's an optional test that we do. Um, so there's two main points here to kind of wrap things up that I want you to take away from distribution testing. The first is that distribution testing is a uniform way to expose boxes to a controlled set of hazards or stresses, so they can be evaluated. Distribution testing will tell us if a box is likely to be able to be shipped from point A to point B under normal expected conditions without experiencing major damage. The second point would be that distribution testing is required for all shipping containers used to transport medical devices, pharmaceutical project, products, and all other types of commerce. So I hope that you now have a greater understanding of what distribution testing is and why it's important. Nelson Labs has always been involved in standards organizations that govern the testing that we do. Being involved helps us to stay abreast of current industry practices and changes to the test methods. So we've been subcontracting transportation and distribution testing for many years. And as such, we've been involved with ASTM and ISTA. And now that we have our own distribution test lab, we've applied for and just received our ISTA certification. We're very, very excited about this. So if you'd like any more information about our testing capabilities and our current pricing, uh, just give us a call here at Nelson or visit our website. I've got my contact information here as well as the website and sales. So thank you for attending our webinar today and have a great day.